Even in the most dire circumstances imaginable, a single act of kindness can change a life forever, and with it, the lives of countless others. Just ask Steve Ross. A new documentary called Etched in Glass chronicles his life, beginning with his childhood, and the five years he spent in concentration camps fighting to stay alive. He was 14 years old when he was liberated at Dachau. On that day, an American soldier came upon Steve, who weighed about 50 pounds. The soldier jumped off his tank, gave Steve food, and embraced him, an act of kindness that moved Steve to tears. I cried for the first time. I fell to his feet. When I kissed his boots, I have searched for this angel for many years without success. May he be blessed by God for his good deed to a young boy during the tragic war years in hell. Steve ended up getting sent to America when he was 16, grew up never knowing that soldier's name, but he searched for him for decades, all the while getting his master's and honorary doctorate, mentoring troubled teens, and speaking to crowds and high schoolers about his experiences whenever he could. Wonderful people who took me under their wings and helped me. The same like you have teachers here who want to help you. Racism, bigotry, stand up. Don't let anyone get away with it. Speak out. Don't be quiet about it. I could tell you plenty of stories because racism is not new to me. I lived with it. Steve Ross went on to found the New England Holocaust Memorial in 95, and in 2012, he came together with the survivors of that soldier. The family found him when they saw the story on a television show. I was recently joined by Steve's son, its former Boston City Councilor Mike Ross, and Roger Lyons, the Emmy Award-winning filmmaker behind the documentary. You know, you reference this in the beginning of the film, Mike, that, you know, some survivors of this horror never talk about it. Some never stop talking about it. Your father is in the latter category. Yeah. Why did he choose that path? I think it was in part to heal his own pain, and, and it's just how he coped. And it's interesting because it was in the 80s. It, you know, he arrived here in, in, the, in the late 40s, and, so he, and then he did all that work in the community. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the 80s that he really got out there and started telling a story in front of large auditoriums. Did you learn anything during the making of this that you didn't know about your father? There were before? a few stories that I, you know, there were a couple of stories. I think I turned to you on a couple, mm -hmm. and I said, uh, there, you know, I didn't know that story. You guys yeah. had done such a good job of, of, of doing this that there were a couple of stories I learned from the film. Why are you involved in this thing? Uh, I was supposed to be doing some little brief profiles of unsung heroes in the community, and I learned about Steve from a friend of mine, and uh, I gave him a call to try to set up a shoot to be ma make him one of our heroes. And I was on the phone for two solid hours with him. No breath. I could not cut in. I finally said, sir, can we just meet at the memorial? And so we did. And wh what I got out of it is it was at a stage in the world when Holocaust denial was really starting mm -hmm. to ramp up, and I felt his story needed to be told. And the story of the Holocaust needed to be told. Let me tell you, the man can really talk. For those of you who think you know everything about the Holocaust from what you've read, until you hear it from the mouth of a survivor, you know absolutely nothing. So the thread throughout this is this incredible search for this young soldier who rescued him, uh, uh, loved him, befriended him, hugged him uh, at Dachau in 1945. Here's a little bit of what your father had to say about that, that man. After I was rescued from hell in the valley of death, I came upon a soldier on a tank that showed me compassion for the first time, concern, and took me back to God, to civilization and mankind. He gave me his food. He put his arm around me, and he gave me a flag. It is hanging here. God. Your father had been nine for until he was 14, 10 concentration camps, and then this guy arrived. I understand feeling indebtedness. I totally understand that. Why was this so important to him for 60 plus years to find this man? Why did that matter so much? This was a cathartic moment for him. This was the moment that everything before it was horrible and everything after it was the best thing that ever happened to him. And he had never encountered a soldier who was kind to him, mm -hmm. of course, not in. Not in mm -hmm. Poland, not in, but certainly not in Nazi Germany and Nazi Poland. Um, and he, it was such a simple act. The guy hopped off his, his tank, he put his arms around him, gave him his food, and handed him a flag. 
which he thought at the time was a handkerchief. And I can't believe you brought the the flag that yeah. was hand, this yeah. that was yeah. handed to your father yeah. in I mean, 1945. Can you just hold it up? Just yeah. hold it up in front I, of me. It's so his the most you know see. valuable prized possession. I mean, you know, nothing comes close. Forty-eight stars. Forty-eight yes. stars. It says. Dachau in the bottom, he wrote, 1945. He, he kissed the soldier's boots. Kiss his boots. Yeah. You know, yeah. one of the things, I mean, I, I don't know if it's hard to laugh at times, but I did laugh at this. Unsolved mysteries. This yeah. search yes. was not just, well, it was pre-Google, yeah. trying to figure out how to do this. So on unsolved mysteries, an attempt right. to find this guy. Roger, describe what happened to a family who happened to watch unsolved mysteries that caused this whole thing to come together. When the show first aired, Steve was on the show talking about trying to find the soldier who liberated him. And the thing that happened was Gwen Allenson Sattler, the daughter of, saw the, saw the film and just kind of kept it to herself for a long time. She ended up telling the story to her granddaughter, Brenda Sattler, who happens to be in town visiting mm -hmm. us. And she went on the internet all night long searching for the person who was in that film. Because her grandfather had told her essentially the exact same story, exact same story. of the young boy, your father, but, from the other side. But they, the, the, grand, the grandfather only said, I gave him something and I hope it helped. That something turned out to be a flag, having seen it on Unsolved Mysteries, on the internet. It was very vague. And then, you know, we had, to, but when I, when she contacted me, because, you know, she's not, my dad never had an email account. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she got in touch with me and I, and, and I was skeptical. You know, I wanted to make sure we're dealing with the right thing. So I didn't give her leading questions. I asked her certain questions that she could verify, and it came down to the knife. And we had learned, my dad talked about the soldier, how he ate his food with a bayonet. And I had found out totally independently that this, this soldier at Thanksgiving dinner would sit down and eat his food with a bayonet. And, and the that, sad part of this is while the soldier died before your father met, he, he and your father and the whole family of the soldier were reunited at a veterans event at the at State Veterans House Day, the in State 2012. House. Yeah. They drove here from Unionville, like 16 hours in the car, and, and half of them were still wearing military uniforms because they still serve in, this, in, the, in the military today. And it's a beautiful reunion when you see it. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Why does your father think he survived when so many others did There not? were a few acts like this. Um, you know, I mean, he, he attributes this, but there were a few things that happened. He was, res he was given to farmers at one point before he was in the camps. Um, he jumped into a little latrine at one point in Budzin, I think. Uh, he, he went under a train in Auschwitz and escaped from Auschwitz. There were these certain things that happened that he, he could have, it was like each was a miracle in its own self. Who's this for? Who do you hope is going to see this? Frankly, I think, I hope it's for everybody, but really for future generations. I mean, one of the reasons that he goes around to the schools, and, or did it anyway, for years, was to speak to them and tell them the truth about the Holocaust so they knew what was really happening, and they could pass that on down to generations. Uh, and what's the takeaway? I mean, for me, the, the takeaway for, for me, the takeaway is this one small act of this soldier spending a few minutes with him transformed his entire life and the lives of others. And that if we can all do that, you know, see the film. It's great. My congratulations, right. and to your father, Thank please. You. And Roger, you did a beautiful job. Thanks, Thanks so much, so much John. Great to see you both. Thank you.